Welcome, everyone. My name is Amy Christensen, and I'm very pleased to be hosting this conversation about solar, probably my favorite topic these days. It's incredibly exciting what's happening in the sector, and we're talking how fast can small grow, and I think you're going to hear that uh, small is already big, and it's growing incredibly quickly, So, and that social entrepreneurs are playing a central role in making that happen, and that we need even more of them out there to help us get to where we need to be. I see solar as the ultimate enabler, whether you're caring about poverty alleviation, climate change, girls' education, productive uses for agriculture, solar is, is central to all of that as an enabling technology. So we have just the right panel uh, with us today to discuss this. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to do my first logistics. Um, silence all your cell phones, please. And definitely use social media, the hashtag, hashtag SkullWF. Um, and please continue the conversation at the URL, URL on the slide. So, um, and the session is being filmed. All right, logistics out of the way. So quick scene setter, globally investment in renewable energy has exceeded investment in fossil fuel based electricity for four years running. We already have in the EU, renewables is the majority of new electric generating capacity for the sixth consecutive year. With 72% of new electricity generation in the EU was renewable energy, and only 10 years before that, conventional fossil generation was 80% of new capacity. So things have flopped, flipped very quickly. Uh, China is number one in new investment in renewable energy. It's number one in new solar PV and solar thermal capacity. It's number one in total renewable energy capacity. Germany is still number one in, total, in solar capacity, as you all probably know. They've been incredible leaders as, part of, as far as creating that policy framework that has enabled that to happen. But I think even more interestingly, in Germany, about half of all renewable energy generation is owned by farmers and individuals, and only 13% by utilities. So where's America in all this? As an American, I have to speak to that. We actually are proud that our solar industry employment is increasing at 20 times the national average job growth rate. Solar is a great job creator and growing numbers of cities and states and companies are taking the lead in solar. So first slide please. How is all of this happening? Solar costs 1977 to 2013. Pretty dramatic drop as you all can see. Next slide. I love this one. Welcome to the Terror Dome. <laughs> World domination is inevitable. Uh, we, that's solar coming out of the sky compared to Henry Hub, natural gas, coal, LNG. So that's solar. So world domination is inevitable. Next slide, please. And even more exciting, I think, are how many communities, states, and national governments, as well as large companies, are making a commitment to 100% renewable energy. Apple is already at 97% renewable energy. Walmart has 100% renewable energy goal. It's actually the number one uh, user of solar in the United States, other than the Pentagon. Um, and we have Scotland right next door uh, with a goal of 100% renewable energy and, and everybody from Djibouti <coughs> to Denmark making these commitments. And that's what's really they wouldn't be making these commitments if this wasn't a cost-effective, smart economic strategy. And that's what's so exciting as an environmentalist for 23 years of my career. It's no longer that this is the right thing to do. It's also the economic smart thing to do for folks. We don't have to have that conversation anymore. Um, I wanted to open up with a, well, let me introduce our panel. We, we really need a combination of government leadership, corporate leadership, entrepreneurs and investors, and we have the right panel to have that conversation of how do all of those pieces fit together to get us where we need to go. We have Danny Kennedy, who's the founder of Sungevity and SpunCube. Um, Danny and I met as youth activists at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, so we go back a long time. Um, and Danny's uh, company, Sungevity, is the largest privately owned solar company in the United States. Kie is the director of the Tsinghua Brookings Institute for Environmental Policy, yes. And Stuart Rowland is British Gas, so we have an incumbent in the room. Um, <laughs> what's the role of the incumbents? They're getting in there too, uh, with the capital and the infrastructure we need, which is very important. And then Xavier Helgeson from Off Grid Electric. Xavier's an entrepreneur in Tanzania, helping to bring uh, solar into those exciting, very fast growing markets. And Harish Handy, I've known for about 20 years too, and Harish is a longtime solar leader as an entrepreneur in India, bringing solar to um, those most in need of electricity 
and poverty alleviation and Depender Saluja from Capricorn Investment to wrap it up um, from how the investment community is taking advantage and helping build this opportunity. So Danny, I'm going to pass it to you. We have two slides for you to open it up to us. You've talked about a terawatt gap in what we need as far as deploying solar at the scale and speed required. I'm hoping you can talk to us about where we are and where we're going. Right. So thanks. Can I stand? <laughs> um, if I'm going to speak for the slides, I may as well just do this quickly. Uh, the, the good news that you heard was that renewables are no longer the new alternative. It's the other way around. They're the mainstream going in in electricity capacity. That's not supply, just to be clear, and it's not all the energy economy. We've still got to get rid of the infernal combustion engine. But as electricity becomes you know, zero to little marginal cost, we'll electrify the vehicle fleet and do that too. Um, and in the meantime, we'll also add a lot of electricity generating capacity. In fact, we'll double the global grids in terms of generating resource. This Bl Bloomberg projection, you can debate the numbers, but effectively a few years ago, there were five and a half thousand gigawatts on Earth. 15 years from now, there'll be 10 and a half thousand gigawatts. GE says it's more like 12 and a half. Someone else says it's 10, whatever. It's going to basically double as we bring a billion plus people into electricity service and add a couple of billion people. And as you see in the years in between, the build out of all that new capacity per the last few years around the world is going to be renewables and the fossil fuel piece and the nuclear piece goes down through time. So that's the good news. Fantastic, amazing story. Incredible job creation narrative, wealth creation narrative, all that good stuff that goes with this because these are more job dense and better return on investment type technologies. Um, trick is that total build out by about 2025 is maybe a terawatt, which is 1 million megawatts of additional electrical capacity on Earth. If you do the climate science, if that's what you all care about because of climate justice talks that you've heard here and elsewhere, um, we probably need two terawatts in a decade. So as good as it is and as hard as it is for the solar industry to keep up this growth rate and do all this work, we need actually to double up what we're doing. Uh, and the, the bits there are, are many, um, but as well as finance to flow into that and you know, a better flow, we need more entrepreneurs to do that work. Um, and a couple of other thoughts on it, just uh, if I may. Um, the, the, the entrepreneurial piece is uh, you know, really quite challenging because uh, we have succeeded in the last number of years, the last decade, spreading solar and wind in particular. Uh, some great news stories where we're doing things like the Germans, where more than half is owned as it should be like locally, which is the, the beautiful thing about solar from a social entrepreneurial point of view. It doesn't need to reproduce the inequities of the 20th century energy system. You know, like fossil fuels were inherently sort of unjust because they're under someone's feet who pretty much necessarily gets displaced. And then someone gets to concentrate those and monopolize those resources and concentrate wealth and power through time. Whereas sunshine spreads pretty evenly around Earth. So you get to sort of have an emancipatory effect if you follow the distributed architecture of the technology. So we're seeing some decentralized ownership and democratized control of these assets, but that's not necessarily the outcome and the end of this story. So that's one challenge I would sort of put to the group. Um, how do we manifest a better energy to system and economy and make sure it doesn't reproduce those innate in inequalities in the energy system to date uh, and the injustices? And then the other is obviously this climate challenge, um, which is that we need to do at least twice as much in half the time. Um, and for that, you need something like the Skull World Forum for Solar Entrepreneurs. You need this sort of movement who are training the people doing the work that Selco has been doing for decades and, and Xavier's doing now and others in the room like Phoenix are doing in, in Africa by the thousand. You know, a, another way to look at that is money. It's a couple trillion dollar economy there and the yellow slice, it's got to be bigger than that. A trillion dollars alone is a thousand billion dollar businesses, a thousand successes. To get a thousand, you need like 10,000 to try. So we don't have that. There aren't that many solar entrepreneurs on Earth. And that's what I'd love us to sort of think about solving. Danny, yeah, just a quick follow up. SpunCube, mm. that's your other endeavor. You're incubating entrepreneurs to help close that terawatt gap. Tell us just a bit more about that. So this is a sort of spin out of Sungevity. It's a business in California, which is a, a for-profit that incubates and accelerates startups in the solar space. They're mostly not hardware because we don't need better hardware or rather 
the hardware will improve with scale. Uh, what's been found is that R&D is not so important as deployment at scale to get better efficiencies, better technologies, better <coughs> form factors, all that value prop stuff. Um, so they're software and financial engineering businesses, broadly speaking, partly because we're in California and Silicon Valley, um, but that's also a lot of what's needed. The, the software to create the intelligence to run a distributed grid, you know, that's a challenge which is gonna be fixed by IT ICT, um, as in African deployments with cell phone based uh, payment systems and software controls and such. So financial engineering, software engineering, 20 companies, 300 employees around the world, you know, some of them are, are great success stories, getting lots of finance, some like Mosaic you might have heard of, um, pioneering new models for crowd financing of solar projects uh, and, and doing really well for their investors. and. Um, I think you need us fun cube pretty much in Bangalore, Beijing, Dar es Salaam, Joburg, Brazil, everywhere you care to name in order to facilitate that. We need hundreds of those spaces and you need an annual forum, not to put too much pressure on the Skull World Forum. <laughs> Pamela, you need something like this to bring all those entrepreneurs together that come out of places like this fun cube. Can you do that final slide, please? Oh, yeah. Great. Danny, did you want to just... Uh, it, it, makes, it makes the point even more dramatically. I mean, I, you know, clearly fossils are on the way down. We're on the way up. Um, that big yellow slice is a remarkable challenge. There's not enough money flowing into the space yet to make that actually happen. And there's simply not enough bodies to do the work. So that gets to us to the big panda in the room, <laughs> China. Uh, it's so exciting what's happening there, the fact that you are number one in uh, installed renewables. Talk to us about China's role. How is the government seeing this opportunity? How are they capitalizing on it? What are you seeing there? All right, well, big panda, I, lo I love it. <laughs> all right, uh, first of all, let me, let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers, particularly Tamla, for having me here for this amazing event, my very first time to uh, come to the Skull Forum is just, I, I, I told my uh, fellow alumni from Tsinghua last night, I said, person like myself and this age, I still get so inspired mm -hmm. by, uh, by this event. Uh, the, uh, now I think the solar is also uh, a very exciting, very inspiring story too. Uh, Amy, you just talked about solar. Uh, I mean, small is already big now. And uh, clearly we see that the, uh, is happening in China. Probably nowhere else is happening in such a massive scale and to such a, uh, a s rapid pace. And uh, r last year, by the end of last year, I've seen the, uh, the installed capacity, installed and connected capacity is 28 gigawatt. And uh, th this, this is amazing if we put this in a historical perspective. In 2005, when China's first renewable law was just passed. And back then, they installed the capacity well, was not, not necessarily connected, was 70 megawatt, right? As compared to the uh, uh, 28 gigawatt, there, there is uh, exactly 400 times the increase as compared to 10 years ago. The, uh, even in 2007, when the, uh, the planners at the, the National Development and, and uh, Reform Commission. They were, they were imagining the future. The future means the 2020. They, were, uh, they want to be imaginative and they want to, to be you know, really the, the open-minded. And they, they gave a number they, they had hoped by the year of 2020 we can reach 1.8 gigawatt. Right? So the, uh, now, with the, right, that's 2020 to 20, within three years, that, that uh, uh, prediction or that, that prediction was exceeded by you know, twice as much. So it's going really fast. I just put this on, on the, uh, uh, in a, a context. The, right now, the expectation is so within three, four years, so possibly you know, we can get the uh, 100 gigawatt. So that, that, that means you know, we'll have the uh, uh, an entire installed and connected capacity that is equivalent, maybe exceeds the, the, the total power generation capacity of the United Kingdom right here. So all solar. <coughs> the, uh, uh, this goes very, very fast. The, uh, uh, so the, the point I want to make here is it really takes some imagination 
in order to picture the future. Even, even, even you know, the, uh, in China, this, this is uh, the case. Amy, you were just talking about uh, such an obvious fact, right? Realize you're talk when you were talking about the, the price of solar is coming down, you said the solar comes to, from the sky. The solar is really coming from the sky, the, the price. And an another uh, interesting fact is if we look at the, this installed capacity, the solar is rocketing you know, back to the sky. It's really, really amazing. The second point I'm trying to make here, the, uh, now I'm just trying to reinforce the point you made there, which is that this really takes a combination of entrepreneurs, you know, the, uh, the, the, the finan uh, financing companies, the, uh, the government, and uh, you know, people who, who have the vision you know, for, for this. The, uh, I, uh, I often tell the story about the, the Yingli Solar. I didn't really know the Yingli, Yingli Solar until a few years ago. Then I realized this was the guy when I was in college and uh, he just uh, wandering around outside the, the university there and uh, just retired from the army and uh, jobless, totally jobless. So then later he just selling cosmetics, uh, the clothes in order to make a living. And uh, just uh, uh, 10 years ago he set up this, this company. Now they are producing more than 500 megawatt capacity each year. So it's uh, one of the largest. The, uh, that, you know, that you can see the, the opportunity and uh, the, the kind of effort an uh, entrepreneur can take this to, 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 to a very uh, interesting level. Now also, I want to point out, the, uh, the government policies really make, make some difference. 10 years ago, 2005, the solar was uh, created totally as part of the industrial development. So there was never a uh, uh, climate change policy or uh, environmental policy towards solar. This was created as something you can, you can develop an industry, but still, and the expectation was very, very low. And we were thinking, uh, China was thinking about just having solar in some, installed in some remote areas, you know, for electrification of the remote areas, or remote rural villages, to have some electricity, to see, you know, to have a light bulb, to, 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 to have, to can, uh, see a, a television. But that, that was the case 10 years ago. But the, the change in the last 10 years really, changed the whole expectation and totally changed the positioning of the, the whole industry. And uh, to May 2012, and China had this major disaster. We thought it was a major disaster when the United States and Europe decided to, to move on for this uh, anti-dumping, anti-subsidy investigation. Then there was such a big panic, you know, where the solar industry will go. But the fact is, for the last two and a half years, we have seen the solar industry was, did, was not stopped. Then it's actually moved very quickly. What, what, what it has done is to create a domestic market within China. The uh, 2013, more than 10 giga gigawatt. 2014, another more than 10 gigawatt of installed capacity. It had actually helped to create this domestic, uh, domestic market. So, uh, not, not, uh, and I guess, you know, we will, uh, you know, for us, all of these are social entrepreneurs, and we're full of imagination. This is the industry that really needs imagination, that inspires imagination. Thank you. Yeah. So, Stuart, our, our incumbent, we're, we're here in your home country. We don't think of the UK as the most sunny place in the world. So, why? Why are you all getting into solar and how? And is it just here or are you also looking around the world? Thank you, Amy. Uh, just a quick introduction about yes. British Gas. Uh, British Gas is the, is the market leading supplier of both electricity and gas in the UK to both businesses and to homes. Uh, and we're part of a bigger international organization called Centrica, which is a, a vertically integrated uh, energy business, uh, principally with interests in North America and the UK. Um, and Centrica has a strategy of, of investment in clean, in clean technologies, uh, basically low carbon energy. So fortunately we're not in coal. Uh, we have a, a portfolio of, of energy producing assets in uh, uh, combined cycle uh, gas turbine, uh, which is lower carbon but not low carbon. Uh, we have nuclear interests in the UK. 
we have wind power both offshore and onshore and we have solar and uh, we think um, that all of those have an, a role to play over the next couple of decades in terms of managing the <coughs> energy trilemma as we call it in the UK which is balancing the needs of uh, sustainability and low carbon future with affordability and um, security of supply and that's something that we talk to government a lot about and it's very very difficult to get that balance there are always trade-offs uh, to make interestingly solar the way we were talking about solar two or three years ago is very different from the way we talk about it today so much has changed even in 24 months time and I think that's what's really exciting uh, for me uh, being in the part of the business that's that's uh, trying to commercialize solar for uh, for British gas um, what's changed you might guess it's the economics uh, fundamentally have changed so much so in the UK we no longer uh, buy our solar panels in Germany we buy them in Bangalore uh, the, the the unit costs are 50% less than they were five years ago and declining and uh, we are seeing uh, very uh, economics that are very close to grid parity uh, which means that solar can stand on its own without government subsidy um, against the mainstream grid supply particularly for customer what we call customer connected installations where the customer is using the energy themselves and therefore they're competing against the retail price of energy rather than the wholesale price of energy which is a very significant distinction in these discussions um, the economics are continuing to, continue to get better. We expect you know, that curve is going to continue and it's going to be a no-brainer that sort of will stand on its own two feet uh, pretty much in, in any um, project that's customer connected in the next few years. Uh, the other aspect that's changed is that other forms of renewable energy are for one reason or other slightly less attractive. They've lost ground a bit against solar. So the, the public support for solar, particularly rooftop solar, is very strong relative to, say, onshore wind, which has aesthetic issues and um, availability of land is an issue, and uh, more attractive than uh, offshore wind, which is you know, increasingly complex and, uh, and, and can be very expensive. So that, that's another factor. And then, and then thirdly, I think the technology roadmap is much more interesting for solar than for those other technologies. In particular, the development of uh, storage is going to be an absolute game changer, we think. And we in North America, we've or in, in the US, we've already done our first solar project with um, lithium iron, lithium iron batteries, in order to be able to capture the energy and use it at peak time. And I think that's the start of something that's really exciting uh, for this sector. Probably most importantly, our customers are demanding this from us now in a way that. There was no conversation three years ago, and we have uh, uh, very large corporate customers who say to us, you know, we could switch supplier for energy, but it might save us only 1%. Uh, we, we can talk to them and say we'll save you 15 to 20% of your energy costs over the next five years if you partner with us around distributed generation uh, installations on their rooftops, uh, combined with ground source heat pumps, uh, com uh, combined heat and power. And um, that's a fantastic conversation for both parties because the value created is huge. Distributed generation, we think, has a profit pool in the UK alone of about £500 million per annum. And uh, interestingly enough, our shareholders would like a piece of that. Um, but equally, I don't, it's not all about money. Uh, we also partner with um, social enterprises. Uh, we've got a very strong uh, social responsibility agenda. And we've actually recently launched the first community program with uh, Gen Community, which is a, uh, a community benefit society. Um, and a third party in that is a social enterprise called Social Finance, who raise money for community projects. And we're the third piece of the puzzle. And uh, that's installing uh, solar locally. Uh, it's community-owned solar. And uh, the proceeds from that go back into reinvestment in the community particularly to help fuel poor customers and also upgrade local facilities. So uh, it's really interesting, it's bringing together new, new partnerships, um, that, you know, different types of partnership than we've had in the past. Uh, overall, a very exciting future. And where is it going to take us? We, we are going to uh, keep pace with the growth in the UK. The growth in the UK is doubling every year in solar, more than. Uh, so we're going to have to run pretty hard because we want to maintain market leadership.
How big do you think it can get for you as far as a share of your corporate? I, I, that's a that's a that's a, a, a great question and one that I struggle to answer. I have to say, um, it's changing. Everything's changing so rapidly. I mean, the price of oil just halved last year. Um, you know, we have a lot of projects in you know upstream that are no no longer uh, looking interesting. Uh, downstream, the sort of ones are looking fascinating. It's going to be a. It's not going to be the majority of our business uh, for the next decade, I don't think. But it's going to be a very substantial share. Great. Thank you. Xavier, so you have such a diverse background and here you are in energy. How did you, how did you get into energy and what you're doing in Tanzania, the innovations that you're bringing to help bring electricity to the underserved? I'm, I'm so interested in your, your backstory and how as a social entrepreneur you're helping to fill this terawatt gap we're talking about. Thanks, Amy. Um, well, I, I have to admit when I got into solar, which was um, not that long ago, I, I didn't, literally didn't know a watt from a volt, and so I had to start from almost zero in my understanding of, of electricity. I was um, uh, an internet book selling entrepreneur before that, which was a com utterly and completely different business in some ways, but um, was, uh, was enabled by software, was enabled, uh, was very distribution heavy business. Uh, we were, uh, that company, Better World Books, became one of the largest used booksellers in uh, the US, uh, UK, uh, through, through an innovative model. Um, and I actually, when I was studying here on, on the Skoll Scholarship, so thank you, Pamela, Skoll Foundation, anyone else who <laughs> supported me in that, um, I, I wanted to find a new opportunity, and I thought that um, the, the potential to provide solar to many more people who live off the grid, um, not sure if everyone knows these numbers, but uh, it's actually more people than in Edison's time are off the electric grid. So population growth has managed to keep pace with electrification. Um, and so we have about a billion and a half people um, still not connected. This is uh, fundamentally not a generation problem, which is most of what we've been talking about here. How do we generate more of our power from solar? This is a distribution problem. How do we um, get power to, that, to the final home? And so a lot of my customers um, are actually right under a uh, grid line. It's literally running right past their head. And it's still probably $1,000 to, to get the home wired, get the meter, get the home connected. Uh, for someone who may make a few hundred a month. Um, so, so I got interested in this. I was very, very lucky. Uh, in, my, in my previous business, we were one of the biggest uh, donors of, actually the biggest donor of, of college textbooks to uh, African universities. So I got to travel there quite a bit and um, became interested in, um, in Africa and its economic development. And met a wonderful woman here named Erica who had worked 10 years in Tanzania and spoke the language and knew the context. And so we kind of just got on the ground and, and started working. Uh, we went there with utterly the wrong business model, and the um, best thing we did was <laughs> kept a very open mind and sat in enough living rooms until we, we got the right one. Um, I think we, we very much build on the shoulders of some giants like, like Harish, who um, uh, will we'll share his story. Um, in terms of saying the, the key to deliver solar um, for these off-grid populations is not really a technical challenge. It's a distribution challenge. It's a marketing challenge. It's a financing challenge. And for the customer, it's about taking away all the risk. So our thesis was not that everyone just needed a loan and then they'd all go for solar. They needed solar that they knew would work and would work to a very high standard. And if, um, if it didn't work, that there was a company that would stand behind it and that they actually had some leverage. And so you can imagine if you, if you take out a loan and you buy a solar system and then three months later it stops working, you, you still owe the loan back. Now you have to pay for kerosene, which is jet fuel, to, to light your home again. Um, and I think the kerosene story is important too. I think many people know this. It's horrific health impacts. It's, it's um, like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for every man, woman, and child in, in a home burning a kerosene lantern. And uh, anyone who's been near one of these when you're, when you're camping or on safari knows it, it gives you a headache after about 15 minutes. And so you can imagine, um, you know, I met, I met a kid, Kenyan kid who got into Stanford and he literally got there by studying in front of this kerosene lamp for, um, you know, hours every night. Um, it's one of the leading causes of fire. It's actually the leading cause of infant poisoning because it's a clear liquid that's in the ground on a, in a plastic bottle. And so you can imagine kids can pick it up and drink it. Um, so I think it's a huge health impact. It's also, as an as a entrepreneur, um, it's a huge cash flow. There's maybe uh, $25 billion a year of jet fuel burned for light, um, which uh, is probably not the most efficient use of it. So 
That's, uh, that's my story. Tell us a little bit more about the model, the what's working, and why Tanzania? Um, so, so Tanzania is, um, has got an, a negative electrification rate. So again, this question, population growth is faster than grid growth. So we may be 12% of people on the grid, 88% off. Um, what we do is we make uh, a modern energy lifestyle, we call it affordable and accessible. So our current offering is for between $7 and $15 a month. You can get, you can light your whole home, you can charge your phone or any USB device, you can listen to the radio. Uh, on the higher end systems, you can watch TV and uh, power a satellite decoder. And this has um, actually been, uh, the biggest demand from the customers has not been make it cheaper, I can't afford $7 a month, I, I need five. It's been give me more power. Okay, what you're doing is great, now I want the bigger one. So uh, before we've introduced the system that would power TV, we would have people say, no, I'll just stick to kerosene until you can power TV. And then I'll switch. This, this lights and phone charging thing is great, but, but I can get by with, with what I'm doing. What I really want is, is to watch TV in my home. Um, and I think that extends uh, more broadly to, I want access to information. Uh, I want uh, access to, I'm sure that will be supplanted by tablets and, and, and laptops in the future as well, as, as people get more connected. Um, and so what we really built our business on was the progress that's been made in LEDs, lithium batteries, solar panels, and we designed a business to be run at scale so where we can, we can mass produce what people want in their home. And uh, our current orders are 10,000 units at a time, and so that's a dramatic cost savings. And we're vertically integrated, so we put that straight to the customer's home through our own sales and service and distribution network. And so the, the savings that you capture in that is just massive and will only continue to increase. And you just pass that on in the form of an affordable uh, monthly rate. Who's providing that capital so that they don't have to buy the system up front? Who's, is that you all? Is it a that's, partner? That, that's us. So we are, um, we are um, in many senses, a distributed utility or a kind of um, radically affordable solar leasing company. So we are very lucky to have investors like Solar City, which is the biggest uh, US solar leasing company, um, uh, Vulcan Capital, Amidyar Network, um, some other venture backers. And we're, we're actually raising our first um, structured finance fund where investors can invest directly into the, um, the payments from the customers. So you can imagine this, this becomes a very predictable payment stream. When you, any one customer may stop paying at any time, but any 10,000 is, is extremely predictable. And so we built the data, we built the analytics, we've installed tens of thousands of customers, we've let them run. And so we can now start to, to plot for people very precisely what their, their return is on, on this investment and trying to make a Tanzanian rooftop a, a, an investable asset, which is kind of the, the mantra of, a, of the business. Now for Tanzania, there was also a market opportunity there as far as policies that you found that weren't, barriers that you found weren't there that were in other places? Uh, thanks, Amy, I mean, this is so important. Um, we, we, we would love more um, proactive support, and there is starting to be some really interesting stuff that's happening in the form of the equivalent of feed-in tariffs for the, for the off-grid world. Um, but Tanzania had zero value-added tax on solar, um, which, which allowed us to enter with a lower price point. Um, foreign businesses could invest and, and repatriate profits. This allowed international investors to come in. Um, and you know, there are other countries that meet the profile of Tanzania, but it was um, set up especially well in this respect. And I think there's some other jurisdictions where um, the market opportunity is just as vast, but the policy environment is lagging behind. And that's absolutely um, hurting their, their, their citizens. And, um, and many of these same markets subsidize kerosene still or, or subsidize um, the existing electric utility heavily, but have not yet seen the potential of, of at least leveling the playing field for, uh, for off-grid solar electrification. Thanks. Harish, you've been in this at least as long, if not the longest of any of us. Um, I think the long, yeah, the longest. Um, and so what have you learned in India through your business model evolution? You were Selco, now you're at the foundation. I'm interested in that and the different roles between those two entities around the investable solar deployment business model versus the grant-based model. Can you tell us a bit about your experience and what do you think it means for this growth for that 1.5 billion? How, how do we take what you've learned and build on it to be more successful and accelerate that deployment? One thing, I mean, in a sense that I, I'm not very, cons I mean, um, I think we're putting too much of attention on panels, the cost of solar panels. Even if the cost of solar panels came to zero, it actually doesn't matter. Even when they were $3 a watt, it didn't actually matter. Because if you look at the poor, and if you divide the poor into three categories of poor, very poor, and abject poverty, 
the question was not on solar panels. Today, for example, the, the solar panels cost might be dra dropping, but the battery prices are actually increasing. So even people might sexily say, oh, LEDs have come in. Yeah, but battery prices are actually not funny at all. And the cost, in fact, and, and then what is happening also is as you, as if, if you're looking at 1.6 billion people, it's very exciting to say that lighting, but see, lighting is just a delta marginal difference to many of the poor. And many of them today need energy access. If you have to look at the poor to actually get out of poverty, how do you link sustainable energy to livelihoods? And many a time, livelihood applications, like sewing machines or silk weaving machines or any of the soldering irons, are one of the most inefficient products. And best, exam best friend of inefficiency is the grid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's why governments justify saying that grid is better to reach to the poor because you're justifying to an inefficient sewing machine to be powered. So we do not have the consumer good or the, or the asset making manufacturers around the world have an incentive to make high powered, high efficient sewing machines high. Then what happens if you start looking at high efficient sewing machines and motors, you make sustainable energy affordable for the poor today. You don't have to go. It's, and again, it's not about solar panel. It's the value that solar electricity provides. Becomes. We are paying too much attention on solar electricity. I really don't care what the graph goes and where it goes. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we are not looking at the other end of the spectrum, which is actually more critical. Uh, you might have a brilliant solar product, but if the financial product is more expensive, the effective product at the doorstep is very expensive. It doesn't matter. So how do you build those market linkages? You might, again, you might have a brilliant sewing machine which actually produces eight shirts. If she is not able to sell the eight shirts in the market, your technology is a debt to her. Mm -hmm. It's the ecosystem of putting around, and, 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 and that's what I, I would say that our business model was more about how do you create that ecosystem around it. And I know there are a lot of people say, oh, I, I still define what, I mean, I would, I know you, you asked me this question that, uh, that it seems I said somewhere that people who are putting money in the real sense to make it viable will lose shirts. That's why I diff did not wear a shirt today. <laughs> uh, you know, the question is, who is putting the money for the ecosystem at all, the development of the ecosystem? Like, if, if it's like Google survives because somebody else paid for the internet. If the internet was not there, Google would not have survived. Who is going to pay for the internet of the solar energy part? And that is the incentive or the subsidies that we require around for, for a business like ours to actually develop. And over the 20 years, a lot of our equity capital or philanthropic money went into creating the ecosystem, training the bankers, creating appropriate financial product for a street vendor or a paddy farmer or for a school teacher or for a priest. These are different financial products. It was equal time that actually took in the innovation of a technology to an innovation of a financial product to an innovation of a market linkage. Who pays for it? And that does not exist in many parts of the world. And we are sexily just telling that solar panels. And many people say, oh, we have done 25 million households. I want to know, if, are those 25 million households having light today? Don't tell me if I did it five years ago. Because many of them are not working. So I, I, I want to caution people that when you are working for the poor, be very careful because it's a marginal money you're taking out of the poor. Until you're not going to create assets, don't make them consumers. So I think that's what we need to look at our business so models. A number of folks in the room are looking to deploy. Yeah, yes, I totally agree. No. <laughs> Thank you, Harish. Right. Um, number of folks in the room have that philanthropic resources have. So who should be investing in that supporting ecosystem and how? And is it governments, philanthropists? How do we create that? And, and is there a role for additional entrepreneurs, for instance? So who, how do we actually make that happen? Whose responsibility is it to oh, it's fill every, that gap? It's everybody, I mean, it's everybody's responsibility. Today what's happening is unnecessarily, I think, impact in, I mean, let's not going into definition of impact investment, but the so-called impact investment uh, uh, is going into as if, as if everything is existing. I'm going to invest in this entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. The entrepreneur is actually serving the poor without looking at whether the entrepreneur has created process. So it's a combination of, of philanthropic money, it's a combination of a government policy, it's a comment of academic institutions having courses of holistic thinking. 
Because today we are producing engineers who are like blindly looking at solar. Uh, you're producing MBAs who are blindly looking at Excel sheets. And, and you are, uh, I mean, we need a mix of engineers, anthropologists, uh, designers, architecture, and humanities to look at a system of ecosystem and how do you look at coursework like and entrepreneurs, for example, I, I go back to the example of ag agricultural revolution in India where the banking sector worked with the vocational schools to come up with energy, uh, sorry, agricultural uh, um, uh, training, like training in water pumping, selling water pumping, selling for how to, s what type of fertilizers to sell. These were coursework. As soon as the entrepreneurs graduated from that coursework, would go to a bank, take a loan. The bank would also loan to the farmers <coughs> to take seeds. And it, so you created a whole ecosystem between vocational schools, the financial institutions, and the farmers. The farmers here being the solar industry. You have the vocational industry and the banking system as the ecosystem actually that is required to build those pieces into place. And here, the scale up, I think we need to rework the word scale up cannot happen through standardization, that one company scales up. We need to look at replication of many entrepreneurs because what happens in one part of India is not re applicable in other part of India. What happens in Tanzania is not actually applicable in Latin America. So what we need is a room full of Lego pieces, mm -hmm. a certain process that's broken up into 10 Lego pieces. You have 100 processes, so you have 100 into 10,000 Lego pieces. I'll pick up Lego piece number four, 15, and 17 and go to Brazil. So we need to create that holistic knowledge bank of processes where entrepreneurs could learn, financiers could learn, policymakers could learn, philanthropists could learn, and that's where the ecosystem can be actually developed. Well, I would bet that we have someone in this school community who can help us create that. So I think, yeah. Thank you. Depender, um, turning to you, our investor. You guys have been investing in this arena for a long time. What are the opportunities you're seeing? And what is, I'm curious about also your role in creating that ecosystem. As an investor, how do you create that successful operating environment to ensure your investments are sure. successful? Sure, sure. I just wanted to start by saying, you know, Danny showed that slide and I think he said, uh, you need a Skull World Forum just for solar. I think, Pamela, you can probably create a correlation that every time you've had a solar panel at Skull World Forum, the installation of solar in the world has doubled from the prior <laughs> year. And so, and it's been happening for the last five years. So I think we just have to keep doing solar panels at School World for, for this party to continue. Um, uh, but uh, on, the, on the investment opportunities side, I think you just heard sort of this v very wide uh, array of opportunity and, and what's happening. Um, you had the examples from Danny, which are largely today, uh, you know, it's largely a Western world story. And then you have the examples from Harish, which is about energy for the poor. Um, I think the, f the first several years really have been about um, solar replacing old energy generation. So it's, you know, the whole Germany story, which is a wonderful gift to the world, uh, was about, you know, it wasn't like Germany didn't have lights and uh, didn't have anything working. It was a question of going from one energy source to another energy source, which was deemed cleaner, better for the environment and, and more desirable. And I think most of the, the graph that you've shown so far has been about that, right? Uh, um, and it, uh, Germany brought on all that capacity. The, a lot of Europe brought on that capacity. Um, uh, a lot of the US has brought on that capacity. China stepped in to fill that need. And uh, that created uh, a very disruptive but wonderful phenomena in which, for the first time in the history of energy, we saw a source of energy fall five times in price in 10 years. Uh, I think other than you know, speculative energy markets where things bright, uh, prices just fall, uh, uh, from an innovation point of view, driving and market forces driving that drop, this is, it has been an amazing thing. And it's obviously fueled uh, this amazing growth. So from an investment point of view, um, I think you know, you're seeing investment opportunities appear across the board. Uh, that story of replacing dirty generation Stone Age to the New Age still exists and is very vibrant and, and big. Uh, uh, even Germany uh, continues to grow, but you are seeing amazing growth in the U.S. and in California and other parts of, of, of the U.S. We're seeing huge growth in Japan. Uh, you heard the China story. Um, Latin America is, is, is emerging as one of the fastest growing regions because it, is, it has a small base. Uh, 
Uh, I think if you look at the, the transformation happening there, uh, Chile is, is, is accounting for the biggest portion, about almost half of that, and Chile is a completely unsubsidized market. And so uh, that's, that's sort of proving to be another example. Yesterday you heard from Tasso in and, and, and the, and the climate justice um, uh, panel where they, where they also tackled this, this, this topic. So that solar genie is out of the bottle. It is now uh, off to scale uh, in most places, uh, as opposed to, more, I think, more places than less. Uh, this whole solar question of is it parity or not uh, is, is largely solved. I think in California, it is cheaper to build a solar power plant than it is to build an equivalent coal power plant. And people would not have guessed that a few years ago. So uh, that space uh, continues to boom and be big. But what you're seeing is um, uh, lots and lots of opportunities, almost you know, an order of magnitude more in everything around it. So whether you talk about the things that Danny talked about or Xavier or Harish, um, we're seeing huge uh, amount of innovation happening in storage because storage is such an essential part of, of an energy system. You can generate, but you need to store. Uh, we are going, we're, we're, we're trying to replace what is a very old way of providing energy, which is this grid where, figuratively speaking, you literally have to generate almost exactly at the same time as when somebody needs to consume, and you have to generate as much as somebody needs to consume. Uh, that's a very simplistic description. There's obviously lots of sophisticated things that have come in between, but largely speaking, as a simple block diagram system, that's what it is. That's a very difficult, and nobody would design it from scratch if they had to do it again. And as we transition to, to this largely solar renewable uh, approach of doing it, uh, having, having that architecture uh, be easier with, 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 with storage and, and, and other sort of electronics aspects to it is going to be a wonderful thing. And then just the characteristic that it can be completely distributed, just the characteristic that Essentially, it doesn't need a grid if you can architect it in, 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 in certain ways. A grid is a wonderful friend, but uh, it doesn't need it. I think those all uh, offer lots of opportunities to create some of these systemic um, things that, that have been talked about. And then you move further out from that. Um, the whole financing models, uh, business models, the way you bring them to customers, the way you finance it, um, how, uh, you know, how do you attract capital of the right type, whether it's equity or debt, et cetera. Um, that area is seeing a lot of interesting innovation as well, and lots of companies have, have come through. You heard some of them mentioned today. Um, in the last six to eight months, this concept of a yield co has emerged, uh, which was always a question as to who's going to pay for all this, where's all this capital going to come from, how are we going to attract large institutional capital to come in and, and, and pay for all this, because this, while is better, cheaper, faster from all different aspects, there is one fundamental difference, which is that you have to pay for 20 years' worth of energy to some extent up front. Somebody has to pay for it. And so that has to be uh, financed in the right way so that people can afford it, uh, they can take bite-sized pieces, etc. So that area is seeing a lot of innovation. Um, Maybe I'll, uh, since we're already an hour into it, yeah. I'll wait for questions yeah, I would around love the space. To. But uh, you know, this is this from a, from an investment, an opportunity, and demand supply aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a wonderful story right now. Yeah. Well, I'd love to follow up, but I would lo first open it up to the audience. Uh, questions for our for our panelists, because Depender, the, the only follow up question I had was going to ask was around more mainstream investors. I mean, Capricorn, you all are looking for double bottom line, triple bottom line. You're looking for impact investments, obviously with a re nice return, but you're, you're particularly interested in these sectors. What are you seeing from more mainstream investors getting into this arena? So uh, I, think, I think the story is mixed there uh, because a lot of the investment was done in what Harish called the solar panel uh, in, the, in, in, in the middle of the last decade. Um, you know, that went through a massive disruption because of, again, the, the Germany plus China effect where demand soared and a huge amount of capacity was put in place and that led to uh, you know, the classic uh, bloodbath. So a lot of people who had invested in that space recoiled mm -hmm. and freaked out. And it was a bit like the year 2000 in the internet where there was a lot of 
there was a lot of pain, but if you compare internet usage in the year 2000 to every year that followed, internet usage didn't fall off. It was only the beginning, right? And so solar has been a bit like that. There was, solar had its year 2000, and there was a lot of pain, yeah. but people misunderstood that as that wasn't because somebody said, you know, why are we selling pet food on the internet? Right. It was because of, 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 a, of a whole bunch of people coming in and, 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 and the market going through its own, its own ways. And people made mistakes, and, but that's all part of the disruption. You, know, you said you, you estimate 10,000 attempts need, are needed for 1,000 to succeed. That, there was an equivalent of that there. So, uh, but I think that is now uh, fairly, I mean, that, that, that storm has passed, that panic has passed, that uh, people just sort of throwing the baby out of the bathwater uh, is largely done. Uh, we'll probably have another cycle, who knows? But um, right now, I don't see too many people panicking about solar. Uh, there's investments happening across the board. Um, you don't have as many investors investing in things like technology and, and other innovation, and I think that's a problem, but, and, and that'll take some time to solve because uh, if you're going to be this mainstream and if you're going to be following those curves for the next 20, 30, 40 years, obviously technology has to, has to be developed while other problems get solved and other, mar other, other opportunities come up. Um, but uh, uh, the other side of the spectrum is that you are seeing a lot of mainstream investors coming in into the downstream businesses, into financing of solar, into um, you know, c coming up with these different models that 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 apply um, the the yield codes I mentioned, uh, the debt providers, uh, people doing crowdsourcing, people uh, doing uh, you know different types of solutions, uh, system solutions where they're combining solar with batteries, with uh, remote management, with uh, uh, PPAs, you know, all sorts of sort of uh, uh, innovation happening in that space. Great. All right, let me open it up. Questions? Really? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this probably is aimed at Stuart and Depender from the investment side, um, the mega investment side. Uh, if we imagine that oil prices may stay low for a while, like three to five years, which it's absolutely possible we could see a $50 price of oil instead of 100 for the next three to five. What, what's the impact on solar investing? Because from the, you know, if the big investment is coming from the Western demand, um, what's your view on invest on mega investment going forward if we are at $50 for the next three to five years? Sure. There's, a, there's sort of a psychological connection between the price of oil and solar. But if you really think about it, there's very little oil that is used in the world for electricity generation. And the oil that is used for electricity generation is actually a pretty bad form of electricity generation. It's, it's when there's nothing else left to burn. Uh, people tend to, to burn. Now, you know, you have certain countries like Saudi Arabia, et cetera, who have a lot of oil, who have historically burnt oil for electricity. But that's a pretty small piece of the market. So I would say beyond that psychological connection that oil prices are falling and therefore energy is cheap, on the, uh, you, you, at the end of the day, uh, when, you, when you play it out, uh, electricity generation is more about coal as the incumbent so far. And that has been uh, an amazing story in the US. Um, coal is, somebody here might have uh, more current statistics, but I think coal electricity generation is now 30% of what it used to be uh, just five years ago. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a newer number, but uh, half, to, half to 30%. Um, that is an amazing thing because coal, I mean, uh, coal is clearly one of the dirtiest forms of, of, of electricity generation. Uh, its only uh, feature was that you could dig a hole in the ground and, and pull it out in lots of places and burn it. And, uh, and if you could convince the people living around these mines that it was okay to have uh, this mining, and if you could convince the people that it was okay to build this massive smokestack in their backyard, you, you did it. And uh, that's clearly getting out of the Stone Age, right? That was the whole thing of how long do we wait to get out of the stones because we're not going to run out of stones in that space. Um, so uh, oil, now, uh, oil does have an effect on transportation. Um, so if we were talking about electrification of vehicles, you would see uh, some effect there 
but that story is still so much in its early years. And there, unlike the electricity generation side in the electrification of transportation, the product is so much better. An electrified product has so many more features. Uh, and uh, I'll exaggerate to make a point. It, it, at some point, it becomes, do you worry about cost when you replace the abacus with this? It's not, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but uh, the, the difference in the electric vehicle and what, what is this very quaint, nice thing like my fireplace, the internal combustion engine, um, is that gap is going to be, that gap is going to get uh, very wide where it's not about cost only. And by the way, that's not an excuse because the costs there are going to come down dramatically as well. And just like the costs in this came down to where I, I would say price performance wise it is much cheaper than an abacus, uh, that will also get there very, very quickly right from there. And price of coal is also going down. Yes. That's right, and and and, but but it's still uh, not winning, which means you know they're also uh, uh, that same effect is happening that people are feeling that this is a better form of better form of electricity. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, Stuart. I think that you know, big energy companies have to put the money where the best returns are, effectively, uh, generally speaking, and the halving of the price of oil has had a dramatic impact in making oil investments significantly less attractive. And a, a huge number of projects are, are now being cancelled in North America and the North Sea. Um, and, and from a planet's point of view, that's good news because more oil and coal stays in the ground. Uh, it actually makes solar more attractive in relative terms for, for investment. And, and, and that's uh, a certainly part of our thinking. I think the, um, to make solar really investable, though, a number of things do have to change. Uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward for us to choose how to use our balance sheet and to point it towards solar investments. But to get third party money in, into solar, you really need to create confidence in, in the regime that surrounds solar. And t historically that's been um, quite a difficult situation because governments have been quite poor at regulating the, the solar uh, sector effectively. And in the UK in particular we've seen significant and abrupt changes to the subsidy regime. Uh, such that you have uh, literally thousands of companies springing up when the subsidies are good and then when the government changes the, the fit tariff thousands of companies go out of business and jobs get lost and it's, it's really been very dispiriting uh, from an industry point of view and from an in investor point of view uninvestable. I think, government, I think governments are learning to be more sophisticated in the way that they manage subsidy regimes and we now have a new uh, digression model which matches the reduction in subsidies over time to the reduction in the unit costs of solar power. Um, and I think that's going to work an awful lot better, create a lot more investor confidence. So I expect that you know, oil staying down at a low level for a long time will actually help tremendously the investment in solar. I would just say that in the US, you all have, I heard yesterday on the climate justice panel that all four political parties in the UK have agreed basically on a common climate change position. In the US, obviously, we have a very different situation. We have our investment tax credits for solar running out end of 2016, and, and it's, it, the lack of predictable, investable climate is so important. Go, sorry, Depender, did you want, and then I want to uh, uh, his, his comments prompted me. We are seeing one connection between oil price dropping and solar, and that is that um, some of the large oil companies uh, that have gotten into renewables as sort of early experiments or trying it because they're in the energy business. Uh, over the last few months, we've kind of been watching that and saying they could have two reactions. One is the price of oil has plummeted and therefore hunker down and just you know, save costs everywhere because we've got to ride the storm out. Or those that are serious about solar kind of saying, you know what, I really need to build that solar business because I don't want to be blockbustered out of this business. I want to be the Netflix at the other end of the of this of the storm. And uh, uh, I can't say that that's happening for sure yet, but they're, they're, they're talking about it. And that could be a very interesting thing because these are very large organizations. They're already present in a lot of the world. And you know, unless we're convinced that their moral compass is completely screwed up and they will fight this tooth and nail to the end, uh, if, they are, if they're just talking about, listen, I used to I used to distribute wheat, and now I'll distribute, you know, rice, and I'll distribute 
whatever dairy, uh, then they could play a very interesting role in this space. They also have access to huge amounts of capital. They also have access to very cheap capital. They have access to thousands of people around the world you know, who can service and, 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 and support this kind of growth that's needed. They think systems, uh, et cetera. But that, could be, that would be a wonderful scenario where they would reinvent themselves and become the providers of, of this new energy uh, and remains to be seen. But they could go, that, you know, that could go both ways. Um, I've got a question about the, you know, Xavier talked about a really amazing statistic, 1.5 billion people off the grid. And then the cost of renewables and solar included going down so that we're not just talking about replacing um, people uh, or, or, or fossil fuel users, but really increasing the number of people that are consuming and the amount of electricity being consumed, right? And I'm wondering if there's an, this, this is like an unintended effect or, or a, an unholy alliance uh, with sellers and manufacturers of electricity consuming goods, appliances, let's say. So is that, does that have negative consequences potentially? And also is there a positive that these, these manufacturers and sellers could also be part of a, a, a political force to bring this about quicker? Um, so I'm wondering any comments on that, because it just occurred to me, this is a, a really huge potential increase in the actu actually amount of uh, capacity uh, for these other industry segments. Great question. Um, a, a few thoughts on that. Uh, one is, I think we all um, we all very much love the benefits that electricity gives us in our in our lives, right? Lights and um, our computers and, and um, our toasters and everything else. And so, I, I think just from a purely moral perspective, um, you know, everyone has rights to these, uh, or as much right as the next person to do this. And that doesn't mean we should try shouldn't try to be a lot more efficient with our energy. Um, but there's far more energy wasted today for example, through the lack of storage on the, on the Western grids, then there ever will be consumed by, by people coming on uh, the grid or, or using power. Um, I think it's also very important to, uh, to recognize that the people that um, we serve or Harish serves use, use a fraction of power, right? a tiny percentage uh, compared to the average uh, US or, or European home, um, just, just by nature of the technology. Solar gets more expensive when you're off the grid and you're self-contained, the bigger the, the demand gets. And so our, our company probably sells 90% efficiency and 10% power because we can just build a customer for lights. You know, they're, they're paying for energy services, they're not paying for watts of power. Um, I do think appliances are incredibly important and I think some of the big guys like Samsung are just starting to realize that the, the off-grid market matters and that it could be big. And so I think it's, it's incumbent on all of us to tell that story uh, to them because uh, our company struggles to find uh, ultra-efficient uh, LED lighting, which would be surprising. You'd think this would be widely available, but there's been a lot of focus on the screw-in replacements for LED for the, the grid-based homes, but not nearly as much for, for the kind of application we do. Uh, the same for ultra-low power televisions, for example. And we, we still look to see a lot of innovation there and, and haven't seen it yet, but it's starting to, to emerge. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, just a quick co uh, comment. Uh, I know you're asking about the negative side of the, uh, the, the consumer uh, ne negative effects from the consumer consumption side. Uh, there is actually a negative uh, effect on the production side as well. We know this generation of technology is silicon-based solar uh, PV and it's extremely energy intensive and, uh, and also uh, polluting. So that, that is what's happening in the last 10 years or so in China. So uh, the, uh, uh, the local uh, residents and uh, the manufacturing area, they're actually bearing this burden of burning a lot of fossil fuel in, in order to produce this clean, clean energy and also to have to bear with the, the, the impact of environmental pollution in order to, also in order to produce the, the solar panels. A sort of a framing idea for you all is um, sort of per the we believe that the world can be a better place narrative here. I, I think energy discourse to date has been at this kind of environmentally framed replacement thing about we've got to switch out one system for another, but that's embedded in the same fossil fuel 
scarcity thinking. You know, it's us against them. It's I own it, you use it, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's a really different energy narrative in the 21st century going forward where electricity becomes abundant. It becomes, you know, to, as we've said, almost no marginal cost. These benefits can accrue. Will there be commercial interests in that? Absolutely. You know, and that's an entrepreneurial opportunity and not necessarily something we should shy away from. Will there be shysters in a commercial opportunity? Yes, there will. Um, but, you know, I, I actually think it's not just 100% clean energy, it's 100% plus. It's all the other opportunity that clean electricity can bring to women, uh, educating those that don't have it, providing not just one and a half billion people today, but two, three billion about to be born with what we all take for granted, clean energy, clean water, food, etc. So, like, yes, there's negatives. We have to control the triple bottom line on all these businesses up and down the value chain, but it's a, it's a beautiful thing if we get there. Thank you. Yes, is that Bunker? Yes. Bunker Roy, Barefoot College. How fast can small grow? Just a small 30-year experience in one minute. <laughs> Millions of villages and communities globally are not going to get grid power for the next 20, 30 years. And we have found that when we, when we visited these villages, they have got solar appliances for which there's no repair and maintenance. The biggest problem of solar technology re reaching these remote villages are repair and maintenance. Hundreds of appliances we find in these villages, we found just selling it, buying it from the local entrepreneur, and they bought it, and no one looks after the repair and maintenance. So we came up with a very interesting partnership model rather than a business model, where we brought the government of India in, we got the private sector in, and we got the community as equal partners to be able to be uh, to facilitate this barefoot model. And the barefoot model is to go to these villages, communities, which are non-electrified, and get them to pay for what they're already paying for kerosene, candles, torch batteries, and diesel. And that comes to about 5 to $10. So we say that if you're willing to get solar power, are you willing to pay $10? And they all say yes, because they're already paying for it. Next, we said well, that we, we need to get someone from the village who would look after the repair and maintenance. So we came up with an innovative solution of training only grandmothers. So we took illiterate, rural grandmothers who've never been to school and college in their lives, and, in, and we brought them to the Barefoot College in India, courtesy government of India. So all the airfare and the training costs are covered by the government of India to, to the Barefoot College. And in six months, these grandmothers, through sign language, learn how to be solar engineers, and they go back and solar electrify their own village. We've done this in 69 countries around the world, and we've trained over 700 grandmothers today. We've covered the whole continent of Africa, and the old 300 grandmothers of Africa are the only solar engineers of Africa, because most of them have disappeared into the cities and gone abroad, but no one has come back to the village. So with that model, we went to the government of India, and now they've given us $400,000 each to set up a barefoot training center in Liberia, in Burkina Faso, in Tanzania, in South Sudan, Zanzibar, Fiji, Guatemala. Biggest problem today with solar is how do you look after the repair and maintenance? The biggest problem with solar is how do you make communities independent and not dependent on urban skills from outside? And the biggest problem with solar is how to demystify and decentralize. And I'm not afraid of subsidies because I think it is much more ethical to subsidize the poor rather than subsidize the rich. So we feel that this is a model which needs to be scaled up. It's already scaling up very fast. And I think this is a model that needs to, it's a partnership model that will work. It's a business. There's not one village today that the business model has covered 100%. You're covering one house here, one house there, but the other people are in darkness. So we have to look at it a bit more ethically today. So, great point, thank you. There is a long history of uh, certain governments dumping their solar technologies around the world and leaving them uh, without any maintenance support. So I'm curious, Harish and, and Xavier, are you all providing that? How, does, how do you address that issue in your business, in your businesses? No, it's been, I mean, Bunker and ourselves have been discussing that 
uh, we have, uh, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a issues that when we enter into the same thing, we had to st do two steps or three steps back because in, in that time in 1994 was that uh, many of the systems that were installed by the government were not working. Yeah. And, and saying that if a s government solar street light, it's like hundreds of regular electricity street lights might not be working, that's nobody's going to complain. But if one solar street light does not work, people say solar does not work, right? So the same, it's a sa and, and it's the same thing with solar water pumps and it's the technology that gets the back, bad name. I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just what uh, we, we believe, I mean, that's where today we are surviving for 20 years because of the after sale service and also caution to the oil companies that who are into this, who, who looked at this off-grid market, many of the oil companies who looked at the developing country are the main culprits because they, they came in when the weather was fine, installed a lot of systems in the rural areas. As soon as the incentive structure changed, most of them disappeared. And now we are, we are, hang, we are, we are actually cleaning up their mess. Because many of the oil company systems, whether it's Philippines, whether it's India, are not working, and the banks are refusing to finance, saying that that company's systems are not working, why don't you first repair it, then I'll finance. So I also caution the big guys that don't come and spoil our markets. If you don't know how to do it, don't come. Well said. Well said. Right. Well, thank you, Harish. Xavier, did you want yeah, to Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on that briefly. I mean. This, I, I really admire what, what um, Bunker Roy has done with, with training the grandmothers. Um, I do want to stress that this can also be designed through, through engineering and, and through systems thinking as well. There's no natural reason why solar systems should fail in huge numbers um, when, they're, when they're kitted together from disparate low quality parts and, and also much of the stuff in the developing world, um, especially uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was, you know, it was expensive, it was low quality, it was lead battery based. Um, what we do today, what Mike does today, is um, plug and play technology. Um, this is not something where you need a solar engineer. You plug the, the solar panel in one port, you plug the lights in the other, and, and, and you're kind of done. Um, mm -hmm. our, our business model is heavily based around a swap in, swap, swap out modality. So if something does break, which absolutely, you need to provide great service. Or, or um, In our business model, that's aligned. So if we don't provide the service, the customer doesn't pay anymore. They, they, don't, they don't buy their next top up. So we are heavily motivated to go to them, swap the box off their wall that's not working, put a box that is working, bring it back to a central repair shop where we can make sure there's not waste, there's not disposal issues, um, et, et cetera. So we, we just need to be thinking holistically about these systems as well and how we, we design out these, these breakages and these inefficiencies uh, in the first place. Thank you. Well, I might just note one final gap that I think might need to be filled, which is perhaps the women gap. So <laughs> I would suggest that um, let's get out there, women, and be social entrepreneurs. And actually, I'm very happy to announce my close friend and I are launching a women-owned, veteran-owned solar company as we speak. So we'll be uh, reporting out on our progress going forward. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, all of you. And I know there are a lot of solar entrepreneurs here. So thank you for all you do.